Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to another, another of our webinar Wednesdays hosted by Cal State Bakersfield Small Business Development Center. Good afternoon. My name is Kelly Bearden. I'm your host today and director of the SBDC right here in downtown Bakersfield. And we got a great, great webinar today. I'm really excited about a lot of the things happening in our community from a business financing perspective. And we're gonna learn a lot about that today. So let's get on with what we're gonna talk about. And today is September 27th, 2023. And what is going on today? Well, our special guests are gonna to talk today about uh, local finance. Business financing is getting a boom. And when I say a boom, I, I don't mean John Madden, you know, the great late John Madden with his boom. Uh, we're getting a boom, not uh, an economic bust like we'll hear from our economists later, but a big boom locally in the community with a new program that we'll be talking about. Our weekly feature, our capital quarter continues on small business debt ceiling. And we found out, you know, three or four months ago that the federal government has a debt ceiling. So we started our own little column on actually what are some of the reasons that small businesses might have a debt ceiling. And today will be our 10th installment in that. Our economic corner today has another weekly feature, has a doctor in the house talking about something new and exciting in the community, an opportunity potentially for many of the small businesses out there. Uh, we will be talking very briefly today on the IRS pausing funding of the employee retention credit, a uh, tremendous amount of, of money that has been allocated to that particular program over the years. We'll be looking very briefly at the potential of a shuttered federal government, a federal government shutdown, and what are the initial impacts on small business. A very quick disaster update for you. As always, we'll take your questions answered live at the conclusion of today's webinar. So if you have a question for any of our speakers today, go to the Q&A box and put it in there. Uh, Maureen will be working uh, today's resources as our webinar producer. Maureen will be in our particular chat box and we'll have our poll. And let's start with our poll questions today. See how? how our poll questions want to work. And our poll questions today, which tend to be hiding from me again, and which is, so our poll questions are right there. Not Dr. Evans yet. Let's go to our poll. Okay, so our particular poll questions, we have our first question for you. We're going to launch the first question, and it's about OpenAI, the artificial intelligence startup that is behind ChatGTP. If you've been listening to the news the last 24 hours, you heard that they're considering going public. And at what valuation is that going to be? You've seen Shark Tank on valuations. Is their value going to be $2 billion? Is their valuation going to be $20 billion? 49 billion or 80 billion dollars. So disregard the last one as far as being poor. I think uh, the valuation is not going to be poor. It's going to be somewhere either to 20, 49 or 80 billion dollars for OpenAI, the artificial art artificial intelligence startup that is by the way owned 49% by Microsoft. But it is Considering going public at a valuation, what is that particular valuation? Is it two, twenty, forty-nine, or eighty billion dollars? One last chance to jump in. We only have forty-eight percent of you participating. Prefer a few more of you jump in, but I understand. Last chance to guess: twenty, forty-nine, eighty billion, or two billion dollars. Okay, we're going to end the poll with fifty-four percent of you and share the results. 42% of you say 20 billion, and not surprising because, you know, I really like that 2080 rule, the 2080 rule rules, parity prog. But in this case, it is incorrect. It is 80 to $90 billion is going to be their projected market value if they go public. So, wow, that's a lot of money for such a new industry, if you ask me, but that's what it is. So our second poll question today is going to be um, actually a 
little more difficult to share, but stop sharing that one and go to our second poll question. And our second poll question is not opening. So I'll just tell you what it was. 55% of you participated in that poll. So literally, let's just go back and just say, hey, they're back at it again. Okay. There's our second poll. So our second poll is, what is the revenue? You've heard about the valuation being $80 billion. What is the revenue that they are experiencing for this particular year? Is it going to be zero? Do they have a million dollars in revenue or a billion dollars in revenue? So chat GTP, you probably saw one of the two artificial intelligence webinars that we've done this year. One of them was specifically on chat GTP. Um, if not, go to our YouTube channel and you can find it there. But open AI, we're going to end this particular poll with 45% of you participating. Share the results. And yes, you are correct. 88%, $1 billion is their revenue, which they anticipate far more than that in 2024. Okay, well, thank you for participating in our polls today. And let me bring in our resident webinar Wednesday resident economist, and that would be Dr. Mark Evans, who's our emeritus professor at Cal State Bakersfield, former economics department chair, associate dean of the School of Business and Public Administration, over 40 years at CSUB, co-founder of the Current Economic Journal, and a 23 induction inductee to the CSUB Faculty Hall of Fame. Dr. Evans, take it away. Uh, what I'm going to touch on today is a uh an emerging opportunity in Kerb, uh, Kern County called Carbon Capture. We'll look a little bit at the opportunities as well as the challenges. Now, the, uh, the 2050 climate goals for the country require between 400 million and 1.8 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide to be buried uh, each year by about 2050. California's share of this would be around 100 million tons a year. Uh, the country is currently operating at about 20 million tons per year of capture and storage. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act in 2021 really cranked up the tax credits for carbon capture. Uh, there's now an $85 a ton uh, tax credit for injecting carbon dioxide per ton uh, into a geological formation, $60 a ton if it's being used for enhanced oil recovery, uh, and then direct air capture, there's $180 a ton uh, tax credit, uh, as well as $130 if the, uh, if the carbon extracted from the air from direct air capture is being used for enhanced oil recovery. And then there's about 35 billion to establish four direct uh, air capture uh, large scale sites in the country. Uh, B3K recently identified renewable energy and carbon capture as opportunity industries for Kern County going forward. Now, when we say DAC or direct air capture, we mean you're pulling air out of the atmosphere, running it through a process that separates the CO2 and then injects it uh, into the ground where uh, when we say CCS or CCUS, the U, the U stands for usage of some of it. Uh, that's where we're pulling it directly from a specific uh, industry site. Okay, there's two uh, policies in California that are really driving the green energy industries, cap and trade, low carbon fuel standards. Uh, what's happening with cap and trade is the total emissions of the, oh, the, nearly 500 or so largest polluters in the state. Uh, there's a cap on their total emissions and that decreases each year. Uh, and a permit is required for each ton of CO2 that's emitted. Uh, some of these permits are just allocated free each year based on historical patterns. Uh, some are auctioned. Uh, and then the number of permits I issued each year equals the, uh, uh, the emissions cap for the year in total. Uh, if you have greater emissions than you have permits, you have to buy permits from somebody else. 
if you have fewer emissions and permits, you can sell your permits and make money off them. The permit price essentially becomes the cost of emitting a ton of uh, carbon dioxide into the air. Uh, that price is around $35 a, a ton in California's market. It's about $100 a ton in the European Union, which also has a cap and trade market. It's obviously going to depend on how many permits are issued and how scarce they are. Now, the low carbon fuel standard, what that does is it creates an average carbon intensity standard for fuels used by ref, uh, refineries and utilities. And this creates a demand uh, for low carbon fuels uh, that can be produced out of renewable resources and then sold to the refineries as a component of their fuel mix. Carbon capture, it's now a business, okay? So there's money in it uh, to a large extent because of these increased uh, uh, tax credits. But your value proposition as a as someone in the CCS business would be, if I capture and bury your CO2 waste stream for you, you will meet your emissions cap. And furthermore, you'll lower your costs in the cap and trade permit market. So uh, this is really taking off. For example, Occidental is now planning 100 large CCS facilities uh, by 2030. They're all going to be used by enhan for enhanced oil recovery. So obviously they're happening in other states that welcome oil production. The economists uh, forecast that $150 billion in private investment will be uh, going toward the CCS industry over the next decade. So we're talking about a growing industry. Okay, it's a growing industry that, that has possibilities here in Kern County. So let's take a look at some of the opportunities as well as the headwinds. Uh, one opportunity is the renewable fuels uh, production industry. What's driving it is a low carbon fuel standard, uh, a, an emerging challenge, but it's going to be a gradual challenge is that by 2040, all big rigs in California will have to be, uh, that, are, that are new are going to have to be zero emission. For drayage trucks serving the ports, all new trucks are going to have to be zero emission by 2024. And then there's a phase in where entire fleets have to be zero emission by 2042, 2035 for the day drayage trucks. So this is obviously going to uh, impact uh, renewable fuels production for trucks and buses. But there are other sectors uh, that are interested in, in these fuels that I've listed here on the left, uh, the other transportation modes, manufacturing industrial sources, uh, electricity and hydrogen production. So this is a sustain sustainable market, I think, even when the trucks phase of it uh, uh, is no longer there. Okay, the direct air capture industry. What's the opportunity? Well, it's impossible to meet our climate goals uh, unless we, we use direct air capture. The Inflation Reduction Act funds feasibility studies. In fact, three oil companies in Kern County recently were awarded $20 million for feasibility studies. The challenge though, is though, that even though it's technologically possible, it's extraordinarily expensive. Estimates run from $600 to $1,000 per ton of CO2 uh, taken from directly from the air. Uh, the atmosphere is a pure public good. You can't exclude anybody from the benefits of cleaner air. Therefore, there's limited commercial uh, possibilities. I would say maybe zero commercial possibilities. So this is an industry that's going to have to be permanently dependent on uh, federal funding. So we have to ask ourselves, uh, is, it, is it budgetarily and politically sustainable? I think right now what we're at is we're funding basically R&D and feasibility, uh, but I, uh, I'm skeptical of this in terms of a long run industry because of the, the extreme expense. What about the wider Southern California region? There's manufacturers, industrial sites all over Southern California. Where are they going to bury their carbon dioxide? Well, the Stanford Center on Carbon Storage recently completed a study where what they did is they, they looked at where all the major CO2 emitters were in California, where all the sites are where it can be buried. 
uh, their conclusion was that there's 41 prospective CO2 storage sites in and around Kern County that are going to be the best option for uh, a number of uh, CO2 emitters that they uh, looked at in Southern California all across uh, uh, counties, Imperial, Kern, LA, Orange, San Bernardino, Santa Barbara, SLO, and Ventura. The challenge, this is going to be extremely complex. Uh, it's never easy permitting pipelines. On top of this, California recently passed a bill that said there will be no new pipelines uh, in California until the federal government creates some standards. The feds in no hurry to do it. And whatever standards they do create, California is likely to one-up them and make them even more difficult in the, the state. So there's tremendous potential here if the state's serious about uh, its climate goals, they have to be willing to allow infrastructure to move the CO2 from where it's being emitted to Kern County here where we can manage it. Then there's the manufacturing industry. Electricity is not a good fuel source for heat intensive processes. So there is growing industrial demand for the types of fuels that we're now producing here. Uh, there's a tremendous locational advantage because if you put the manufacturing here, you save those uh, transportation costs of moving it here, as well as the political problems. Uh, again, other cost factors would have to align, but uh, uh, if, we're, if we will never meet our, uh, our goals unless Kern County becomes a hub for Southern California. Thoughts? There's a sound economic justification for government promoting renewable energy. The atmosphere is a public good, just like national defense. So the government has to be involved. Uh, I am now more optimistic. Uh, the more I look at this, the more optimistic I get. I think regional economic transformation is possible, uh, but there is a great risk. The great risk is the instability of federal policies. Policy reversal is now the norm. Uh, it just fluctuates 180 degrees, whether depending on whether it's uh, one party or the other in control, uh, but we better do something. Here's the 10 year uh, trend in mining and oil. Uh, the GDP originating in Kern County oil is now 50% less just in nominal dollars than it was 10 years ago. That's not even adjusting for inflation, it's 50% less. Uh, the share of GDP that comes from the oil and mining sector has gone from about 30% to about 12.5%. Our jobs are 5,000 less than they were 10 years ago, which is about a 39% decline. So hopefully we do something. And with that, I'll pass it back to Kelly. Fascinating stuff, doctor, as usual. Appreciate it. And uh, really a, a good glimpse of really a lot of stuff going on right now in higher education. And so when we're talking about higher education, we're talking about BC and CSUB that are wrapping around this. And hopefully, hopefully we have a solution here. Okay, so moving right along our capital quarter, we won't go through our uh, debt ceiling for small business factors that can limit you and raise in capital of the previous nine that we have. There's seven of them, but we will identify number 10, and that is going to be know the loan program requirements that you are applying for. The loan program requirements are going to vary. You'll find that out in just a few minutes on some of the programs that could potentially be coming to Kern County really quick. And then also, you know, a lot of the programs that are existing, like uh, what are you going to need as far as the program requirements? Are you going to need a capital contribution, also known as a down payment for that particular loan? Are you going to need to pledge security or collateral? If you do, you need to identify what it is and make it easier for your lender to understand what you have as far as security or collateral to pledge, depending on the program requirements. Another one could be the minimum credit score. So just understanding, working with maybe uh, your, your, your lender, working with a, your technical service provider, your SBDC, and actually identifying a lot of the things up front that can really make it a lot easier for you to get that loan and actually blow through that debt ceiling. Uh, for those that have been around, you probably understand that that is my 
signature pitcher for the disaster that we've gone through earlier this spring, up at 8,000 feet. There's the snow, maybe six weeks after the disaster. There's a little bit on the disaster loan programs. And just a real quick brief thing to talk about today would be the economic injury loans. If your business has been impacted, there are still economic injury loans that are available. You could still be experiencing that injury. You could have a supplier. You could have a major customer that hasn't been able to, or a product or service that you have not been able to actually fulfill the potential or the expectations of the past. And that's an economic injury. And you have until January of 2024 to apply. Also, the other thing we're looking at still is mitigation. And if you have had some damage, and maybe that is property damage, uh, physical damage to your your residence or your business, that there are mitigation factors that are available that you could actually change and prevent that from happening in the future. Our community calendar of things that are all good things that are happening. Um, good news, our Kern Capital Summit is returning. We'll have details really soon on uh, webinar Wednesday, but the Kern Capital Summit, a chance for you to find out all of the resources that are available that are out there from at least a dozen different potential sources of debt, equity, and grant funding. Also, our small business credit survey that we're working with the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco on. It's a national poll. We really want to get represented in our part of the world and here in Kern County and maybe even in Inyo and Mono County as well that we serve. So here's an opportunity. You'll see the link to the Federal Reserve Survey. It is a 12-minute survey that, that really asks you a lot of questions on if you're looking for capital and you're experiencing accessing capital. And it's vitally important. It's important to us because if we get enough applications, we're going to have our own subset of data that we can go back and look at and really analyze what is going on from a capital perspective here. So please, if you're a small business that has been looking for capital, go to the link in the chat box and fill out the Federal Reserve Survey. If you know anybody who's wanting to start a child care business, huge need for child care businesses, uh, Nurture is outstanding. You've seen them here on webinar Wednesday talk about how to run a small business daycare business out of your home. There are grants available. The latest class has recently started, but you can still reach out and maybe catch up. And we're always looking for new ways to fund these particular businesses because of the acute need of child care services for people working in our community. Our free resource hotline information that we have been touting um, from the California Employers Association, if you're in a number of different counties, there's how you access that particular there's also a past webinar on that particular topic. Our entrepreneurship grant program that we're working with the city of Bakersfield on, where you can actually meet with an advisor to check out eligibility. A lot of eligibility requirements in here. Trust me, a lot of eligibility requirements. Uh, you don't need to go it alone if you're located within a qualified census track within the city of Bakersfield. Also, there's a uh, training and also technical service requirements. There's still the Bakersfield Food Management Program, really reaching out to a vital sector, uh, particularly trying to help a lot of the mom and pop businesses that are just being hammered by minimum wage and supply chain inflation, a lot of different issues that are really affecting small businesses and particularly those in the food service. Our friends at CSUB's Extended Education have partnered with us in order to try to provide this training. And it also counts as training for those that are looking for grants through the city of Bakersfield. If you enjoyed today's webinar, or if you didn't, uh, you know, we always welcome your feedback. So look for your survey. You could also go to our CSUB YouTube channel and subscribe. Last time I looked, we had 369 subscribers, 244 videos. This video from this webinar Wednesday will be up there in a matter of days. Uh, you could also go to the chat and leave comments and suggest topics and other webinar Wednesday presenters that you would like to see. We're going to be here about every Wednesday. So uh, let us know what you want to have and what you want to see coming up. And you could also go to our business profile on Google and leave a review. So please, we appreciate your feedback. And let's move on to our first of two very special guests today. And our first one is going to be Deanna Blaze, who's the Senior Vice President of Business Bank and Valley Strong Credit Union. She joined the credit union in 2019 as responsible for the business banking division. She has a vast amount of experience 
experience, apparently started working when she was about eight years old, uh, but see, 12 years of experience at Rabobank, uh, 13 years as a marketing director for original CPA firm Brown Andersons, and also San Joaquin Bank, graduate of the, it seems like every banker is a graduate of the of banking at Pacific. Pacific Coast Banking School, I put the marquee banking school in the country. Uh, she's very involved in her community. Uh, she's about ready to start her second stint as chairwoman of the Bakersfield Women's Business Conference. Number of other uh, entities that she's uh, actually involved with, several nonprofits. Deanna and her husband, Kenny, love anything outdoors with their two grown children. Deanna, great to have you on here. Jump in here and take it away. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me visit today. Really excited to be here again. And it's been a while since we've had an opportunity to check in. We've been really busy over at Valley Strong, and I'm excited to share this webinar Wednesday um, with my good friend, Shantae Smith, who comes to us um, as our new CDFI director. She's pretty phenomenal. We're very fortunate to have her. You know, we've been investing in our business banking program um, over the last several years, about four years now, really bringing products and services that are going to help our community in the areas that we're serving our community. So that comes along with the work we did during our PPP loans that were out there and we're able to help businesses. We help the current small business relief program and now our new endeavor, our CDFI certification. So I'm going to ask Shantae to come on screen with me and she's going to do a little introduction about the work we've done so far. And we'll talk a little bit about some of our products and services. So I'm going to turn it over to Shantae. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I am happy to be you know, on here and introducing everyone to our CDFI and the work that we are actually going to be doing under our CDFI. We're also going to share with some of the work that we are doing currently right now and that we've been doing as a credit union as well, um, because we've been at work before we, we were even certified. Um, but before we get started, just a little about myself. I've been in the financial industry for 23 years. So when Deanna was taking deposits at the door at eight years old, I was being bo born. And so we've been in this industry for a very long time. I've done work in our community as well and happy to be the director of our community development financial institution here at Valley Strong. So I want to share first that as a credit union, we have been designated as a low income credit union. What that means is that we've been servicing uh, members um, under our consumer banking side of, the, of our institution, where we, we actually have done uh, a lot of lending that has been for customers that may have not you know, gotten approved with traditional banking style. We have opened up our business banking uh, part of our credit union back in 2019 when Deanna came on board and has you know, uplifted our business banking side of our credit union. And so we've been doing the work as a credit union and supporting our consumers with lending. And now we're excited about being able to upstart the CDFI. And the CDFI, we, we actually got our certification this year in April. And for any of you that says, well, what's the big difference between you all being a certain a CDFI now versus what we're doing already? The CDFI allows us to actually receive funds to actually ignite more lending throughout Kern County and our Central Valley. And that is why it's important that we're, we're allowed to have these programs. But it's also important to know that it's not our traditional banking underwriting guidelines. Um, it's going to give more access to capital for those folks that typically may not meet most banking institution and credit union guidelines. That's where the CDFI may be the right type of lending opportunities for yourself and your businesses. And so it, I like to think of it, that's why the first word is community, because it's an ecosystem of help for small business owners. So the reason why we became a CDFI was initially because of the amount of growth, the amount of um, opportunity that you know, people have in becoming a small business owner. What kind of ignited the growth of small business owners moving towards opening their own businesses was really the pandemic. 
Uh, when people had, you know, came into an opportunity where they lost their jobs and provided and loss of income, many people got to work. Many people took that hobby that they've been doing for many years. That's why many of you are here today and turned it into a business. But the biggest thing that people are impacted by is needing access to capital. And access to capital means access, access to funds. Needing more funds to put more product out, maybe pay a, a small staff to help you uplift your business. And so many customers do not fit the typical underwriting guidelines that are fit for lending today. And sometimes you need just enough capacity to get by. So that is why the CDFIs are, you know, are uplifting to our community. Just a little bit over two years ago, we didn't even have a CDFI in our area. Now we have about three to four CDFIs throughout Kern County and in more throughout the Central Valley. As you, as there were, the banks and banking institutions have seen, it is a high need today for small business owners to have access to capital. So most business owners um, that we see that are growing is minority women. And not just women, but you also have veterans that are part of that minority as well. So being able to have that access is going to provide more lending and opportunity for small business owners to grow. Now, our goals in this, and as you'll see, is as we get into having our, our funding, the funding will come in 2024. So right now we are doing small business lending, but many of it is utilized through our own capital. Next year, we will be able to uplift and start utilizing the capital that we gain from our CDFI fund. So we're at, right now, our first goal is to build a lending product under the CDFI that's going to be able to help upstart many business owners. The other thing with us having the capacity to do more lending that we're doing than more than what we're doing today, it's going to help increase jobs in our community, also help increase the amount of small business owners being uplifted throughout our community as well. In that, what many people don't realize is that the CDFI is also here to support an ecosystem of support and help throughout the community. And that's another thing that we are making moves in doing today. So with that, we're working within our ecosystem. You'll hear me say ecosystem quite a bit today. Part of that ecosystem is not just us being a CDFI along with the other CDFIs that, are, that we're aligned with, but also it's being here with the Small Business Development Center with CSUB. It's also being a part of other organizations where we will actually send you to get more training, build a business plan, build financial projections so that you better understand your business. So the CDFI setting up that ecosystem, you will hear words such as technical assistant partners. Technical assistant partners are just as that as SBDC. We may need a business plan to approve you for a CDFI loan. We may need to look at what is your future financial projections. Not only is an institution needing that, but it also you need to understand your business, how to utilize the funds that you're asking for, and what where do we actually see the business your business growing to in the future. These are things that we're going to be doing to support business owners to better understand your business and opportunities for you to grow. The last and the biggest piece of this is the support of us having that revolving loan fund, being able to access lending out to more small business owners in the community. Now, it's not just a turn of a thumb like, oh, we have money to give. These are things that have to align under the CDFI as per the CDFI fund policy. So there'll be times where some business owners may not be ready for the large loans that you dream to have, but we will set up a foundational steps to guide you in being able to make smart business choices. Now on this next page that I wanna share, these are just some of the actual organizations throughout our community here in Kern that we are aligning with. There'll be times where we will, you'll be sent, if you go to some of these organizations, they'll send you here to one, one of either us or other CDFI institutions that can help support you in your lending capacity. But there's also times when you'll come to us as a CDFI for assistance, and we will ask you to see some of these other organizations to get more training and more support for your business as well. So make sure you're open to that. Just because we're sending you out to work with some of our partners, we're asking you to do this so that we can better support you as well. Now, 
There's a lot that I've shared on this call to talk about our CDFI. Let's show you a little bit of what we've been doing currently and using our own capital as a credit union. So in supporting our members and our small business members in our community, we're just giving you a snapshot of what we've done so far this year under 100,000. Small business loans that we've done under 100,000 as of right now, as of July 14th of this year, we've already funded about 1.8 million. And if you look at what we've done for the small businesses under 50,000 this year, we've already funded close to 1.5 million. Now, of course, now we're, we're over those numbers and we'll bring those numbers uh, back in another call that we'll do with the SBDC. But I want to make a point here. Last year, in 2022, we funded 1.5 million in small business loans. Just middle the middle of this year, we already met that number. So you can imagine how much you need for access to capital we have just here throughout the Central Valley. These totals are not just for Kern County, but in our, or the rest of our footprints, Tulare, Visalia, and Solano County. So if y'all didn't know that, Valley Strong is also, we have a footprint in, throughout the entire Central Valley and we're doing the work. And so you can only imagine the volume that we're doing right now. And that's without our CDFI funds next year, uh, we'll be able to do even more. So there's so much that, that comes with just the access to capital. There's so much education that's needed. And we have so many folks that stand not only, you know, on the sidelines with me and Deanna and Kelly Bearden, but there's so many other organizations that's ready to support all of the small business owners that are here in our community. Now, I'm going to pass it back to Deanna to talk a little bit more about the work that we are actually doing with business owners today. Thank you, Shantae. So as Shantae mentioned, some of the lending that we are already doing in our communities that we're serving is by doing real estate lending, commercial lines of credit, equipment lending. Sometimes business owners are looking for that food truck. Maybe it's an auto that they're needing or a specialty piece of equipment or software. We've already been able to do that. And one of the elements that I think a lot of people still weren't aware of, you know, in some organizations, they require two years in business before you can even apply for a loan. At Valley Strong, we have been working since we started in 2019 with a small entry level um, loan through about 25,000, even if a business has not been in business for two years. What that's doing is allowing us to really rely on a person's financial character, how they've handled their debts in the past, and rely a little bit more on the personal side when they're looking to have a little bit of startup capital for their company. Um, most importantly, though, they do have to have a formed entity and be able to provide information about the use of those funds. So that is one way we continue to be able to um, be business friendly. We're focused on educating our entrepreneurs. And as Shantae mentioned, it's important to us that we partner with the SBDC, Current Small Business Women's Center, and resources such as that so that we can build that technical assistance for the business owners. Because many of our business owners that we're seeing come in and aren't quite loan ready. And as we get into talking a little bit more what the CDFI will do, what this does, it allows us to have a little bit um, alternative underwriting, which may look at going forward, maybe there'll be a lower minimum credit score, um, maybe the years in business, you know, again, not definitely requiring the two years in business. We might look at non-traditional credit qualifications, like looking at your bank statements for your business, maybe relying on some utility bills or a cell phone bill to kind of look at the credit um, character and how a business owner is paying their debts on time. What does that look like? Can we look at alternative methods? Um, we also want to know, you know, what contributions have you made in the business? Do you have your own skin in the game? What is that going to look like? As you come to a lender, some people think, oh, well, I'm not putting or risking any of my own capital. Well, we're going to ask that you have some skin in the game so that we show how much passion you have for that company, just as much as we want to be behind you. And then definitely, as Shantae mentioned, really making sure that you do have a good business plan and it does make sense on the projections that you think your business is going to generate in revenue and do the expenses you have really make sense for the industry that you're in. 
And also the other piece that we want to definitely make sure that's a part of qualifying you for a CDFI type lending um, is making sure that you have the ability to produce some projections for your business with a balance sheet and income statement or look at some historical information. If you're coming to us as a seasoned business owner and haven't maybe needed to have some lending and now you do need lending, um, we're gonna ask for some of those documents and many of the business owners that are entrepreneurs or just getting started aren't quite familiar with some of these financial documents, but it's gonna be really important that you can bring those documents and get familiar with them. And the most important thing about that is that you have to be able to tell the story, the financial story of what's going on in your company. Um, you're going to use those documents to know, is your company doing really well? Or maybe have you run into a pitfall within your financial information there? Or maybe it's looking at your expenses. Are your expenses out of line? Do you maybe need to cut back somewhere? So without using those good financial documents, it makes it really difficult to know where you can make those adjustments in your business in order to um, help you become more successful going forward. So... We also may look at um, different avenues of collateral. So as Shante mentioned, and even Kelly, um, be prepared to talk that through and know what collateral you may have available um, to secure that lending for you. And the other thing we're also going to be looking at from the CDFI qualification is this word around community. Is what your business doing, is that providing some benefit to our community? Are you creating jobs in the community? Is the mission of your company fulfilling what the mission is of what we're trying to do at the credit union in supporting and uplifting our economy? These are all things that you'll hear us talk about a little bit more. And I hope, Kelly, that we'll be able to come back and talk about the more secure products that we will have coming in 2024 when we receive our first grant. So again, like Shante mentioned, we're open for business already. We're open to having conversations with all of you to help understand where you are at this point in your business journey and how can we be of an assistance to you more from an advisory perspective and understand where your needs are because we'd love to learn more from you as to what the biggest needs are out there in the community. We've done some research ourselves. You know, we, we think we have a good understanding of that. However, there's nothing better than hearing directly from the business owner and understanding where we need to meet those needs. So um, right now, I'll turn it back over to Kelly and see if we have any questions. Well, very exciting. Very exciting times. You know, it's great having a, a CD, CDFI located here in Kern County, our second one in as many years. And I know the opportunities for small business owners is going to be in greatly because of that designation. And I know that there's other things you have to have funding for that and that you're going to be applying for funding. So there's a lot of exciting things coming. We do have one question in the question box, and now's your time to jump in and ask particular questions. Uh, we got the leaders right here in CDFI in Kern County. So how is a CDFI different from an SBA loan? Well, that's a, that's a good question, Kelly. I would say one of the main differences is the lending is actually going to come directly from the lender who is a certified CDFI um, lender. And oftentimes, some of these lenders also do SBA lending. Um, the SBA typically are programs that lenders can partake in as well. So you're, I think that's really the main difference is that it's, it's the loan is coming directly from the lender without having the SBA guarantee behind it. However, we, I can tell you at Belly Strong, we are looking to utilize the state guarantee program which is another program that helps with an 80% guarantee, possibly when a business owner doesn't quite have maybe the collateral to support the requests they need, but we can get comfortable by utilizing that state guarantee or perhaps sometimes continuing to partner with the small business administration to align the correct um, loan maybe that the business owner needs. So you might hear a lender talk about and ask lots of questions to make sure we're structuring what you need properly that is really going to be the best fit for the business. Well, that's exciting to hear that you're going to be utilizing the state guarantee program. Uh, we've talked a lot on webinar Wednesday about the state small business credit initiative, which is essentially $10 billion coming out from the treasury, a big chunk of that to California. A lot of it's 
in that particular program. And really, I haven't heard of another local lender who is going to be participating in the state guarantee where a lot of that money is gone. Um, so that's exciting. It's exciting. So uh, have you, you, you have a vast number of deals that you've done already, less than 50,000. Yeah. Are those loans that you're doing direct or are you doing looking for some form of guarantee from SBA or the state or have most of those just been direct lending so far? Most of that has just been direct lending so far. Um, at the credit union, we are working on um, actually becoming an express lender by SBA. So that's um, something I can tell a little bit more about as we get closer with that. Um, it does require a lender to uh, produce a, a certain amount of quantity of lending before they can be certified. So um, we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, I think when it comes to some of the other, um, got a little bit of background noise, I apologize for that. Um, we can talk a little bit more when we can use the SBA guarantees out there. Um, that's would be, you know, sometimes we're looking at on the real estate side, utilizing the 504 program. I think there was a question out there of how much equity injection would the business have to have. That's going to vary, you know, the, depending upon if you're going the CDFI lending route or if we're going to utilize any of the other guarantee programs. That can be we're looking at anywhere probably from five or 10 percent and sometimes all the way maybe to a little bit more looking at 20 percent. Um, equity, but it, again, it really depends on the program and the needs of that particular business owner. There's never one size fits all, you know, even though some of our products look the same, every business owner is at a different pace and stage in their business when they come to us. So we like to have a really good thorough interview when it comes to making sure we're aligning you with the right product. So you talked a little bit about your footprint being, it sounds like it goes up the San Joaquin Valley. Um, is your footprint going to expand any, or is that the footprint that you see moving forward with small business lending? I would say definitely, Kelly, we are heavily focused, obviously, in Kern County. Um, Tulare Kings was the secondary that we expanded to. And then we are in the Solano market, Fairfield, um, Vacaville, and then the San Joaquin County, too, which is stocked in Lodi. Um, definitely up that inner corridor of the Central Valley. Um, we do follow a lot of the low income designation rural areas. And so you'll see us really partner with those communities um, as we extend further. Um, but our first initial focus will be in Kern County as we get our programs off the ground. Um, that's where some of the research was done and understand the biggest need. However, we are aware of many other financial deserts that are out there and the demand that businesses need, you know, access to capital. Great. Uh, Kelly, I would just add to you guys, we were approved for to service 26 counties under the CDFI, <laughs> so which is not common. Other loan programs, when I would tell them that they'd be like, what? You know, because usually you get a handful of counties to service. And so most of um, our CDFI was designated to pretty much almost service all of California, which was pretty big. But our main focus is here in Kern County. Right. The Treasury likes to do that, huh? They like to expand your territory for you. I've heard that before. Uh, there's a question, and I, I just really am trying, I'm struggling. Maybe you can figure out what the question is. What businesses are hot valley? Maybe what businesses are hot in the valley? What's, I'm not sure. If you could clarify that just a little bit, um, that would help a lot. Maybe meaning like the most popular? that we're seeing maybe? Yeah, That's what I was thinking they were asking. Well, if you have an answer. Um, you know, I'd Kelly, love to hear I, it. I, I, I would say if they're thinking around, you know, the most popular, I would say we definitely see a lot of service type companies, a uh, lot of food industry on the small business side. We're definitely seeing some um, childcare, believe it or not. I saw you talk about, you know, the grant funding out there for that some food truck businesses, I will tell you, um, it's almost like a bi-weekly basis. We'll see somebody coming in wanting to finance a food truck. So I bet you Norma Dunn has done a fabulous job in educating people about how to launch a successful food truck. So um, we see all types of things, but definitely service industry is pretty prevalent right now. Great. Uh, there's a question. 
how can my cre- how can my credit union get a CDF designation here in Fresno? Um, you do have a few CDFIs in Fresno. One of them located locally is Access Plus Capital, a non-credit union. But I think maybe we could go to a question. Is is there a separate designation for CDFIs for credit unions than nonprofits? Are you- um, I would say um, the question around how did, how can that credit union in Fresno receive that designation? I will tell you, we can also um, receive a call after this if you'd like. We actually worked with a... Um, a consultant to assist us with that at C Strategic Planning, and they helped us apply for the certification from the U.S. Treasury. Now, the U.S. Treasury did have a hiatus on new applications there for a while, um, and I'm not certain quite yet if they've opened up the application process yet, um, but I will tell you, um, I don't think they plan to open that up until April unless that has changed. But if it has, then I would say um, you might want to talk with a consultant to get some food for thought around what goes into the application process. So um, if you need more help, give us a call. We're happy to have a call with you. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, too, there's a lot of documentation they're going to ask because you are a credit union. And if you already have a lending space, be ready to have your information ready to upload Um for that, but the, I would I would highly advise a, getting a consult a consultant that can help you with your application as well. Yeah, it seems to be a very lengthy process, and if you're just looking for your credit union to offer CDFI services, Valley Strong they provide services in Fresno County, maybe. Um, We don't have a branch location there, but it does not mean we can't assist um, through one of our other locations, uh, such as Visalia, which is fairly close to Fresno, but happy to have a conversation with folks in Fresno as well. Great. Okay, so uh, another question. Are CDFI loans geographically based, such as disadvantaged census tracts? Um, you know, there, Kelly, I can say what we're learning is depending upon the programs that we decide to put out or apply for, for grant funding, um, we can focus on certain census tracts. Uh, for example, we are working with Solano, um, economic development center that they've received some funding for a revolving loan fund that is focused on very specific census tracts. Um, especially those industries that were hit pretty hard by the pandemic, which would be food service, event type center, organization, hair salons, as an example, to name a few, Um, that is focused on census tract lending. So um, the qualifications are a little bit easier to qualify. Um, They are still a loan. Um, Some of these aren't necessarily grant funding. So um, keep that in mind. And it is somewhat of a focus on revolving loan funds as well. So I have a question. Are two of your 26 designated counties through the CDFI, are they Inyo or Mono counties? Inyo is on on there as well. Yes. Good, Good. because, you know, Kern County is not big enough for the SBDC to serve, so we serve Inyo and Mono as well. (laughs) And you talk about a financial desert. The Eastern Sierra is a financial desert. Um, but that's okay. Our Eastern Sierra Capital Summit that we do annually is a uh, oasis in that desert and other other areas. Yeah, I, okay. have, to, oh, I, was gonna say, I have to say that's where our partnership with Alta One Federal Credit Union, you know, comes into play. We mm-hmm. are definitely collaborative partners. The same with Access Plus Capital. Uh, we've really been focused on collaborating with all of these organizations to bring these resources to light to our business community um, where they really need it. So we're, we're definitely all hands on deck. Fantastic. And I'd like to say, too, we're allies in this. Mm-hmm. As uh, the, you'll see with the CDFIs, we don't, we're not in competition with each other. We're, we're here to support. And so we actually align together every month to look at where's the need at for our small business community so that each of us have a stake in the ground on how we can support. So a question, are there any programs that help build business credit? Are you I, going to- 
I would say um, one of the programs that we actually use to help business owners that are just getting started and trying to build credit is actually our business credit card. Um, it is a, a lower entry level rate, I believe, out there, and it can help even if it's a small incre incremental um, availability, whether it be you know, as small as 500 all the way possibly to 5,000. Um, that is a good way to get started under the business name with a business owner guarantee. That's one example. Also, one of our one of our our barriers to funding is the liquid credit score that is now being utilized for businesses and in, in many institutions, which is a different FICO score, not based on the individual, but based on the liquid score of the business. That might be an opportunity. There are some things that are happening, I think, in it's outside of the realm of what we do as far as personal, yeah. funds, but there are some things that are happening. So hopefully more in that particular area. Okay, let's let's go through the chat very quickly, see if we missed any questions, um, and also look at some of the resources that have been added. There's contact information for Deanne and Shante that's listed in there. Um, also, seeing some of the things, uh, questions that we've answered, some of the other resources that we discussed today, all covered in your chat today. Feel free to jump in and grab any of those resources. You do realize that after today, th this recording will go out to all those that registered and those that are, are in attendance, not only a list of all the resources in the chat, but also a recording of today's webinar. And that'll be coming through email in just a couple of days. Any last comment, ladies? I would just say for me, um, if you need assistance, please reach out. We're happy to have any additional conversations after this meeting. It doesn't mean um, just because this call is ending um, that we can't have another conversation. So happy to talk through anything that a business owner might need. And I'll turn it to Shante. I just wanna say, you know, don't forget the financial management of your business. Oftentimes, business owners, you have a passion and you know to run your business. Do not forget the financial management side is what keeps the business running. So be patient and continue to educate yourselves and reach out for help. Thank you, Kelly. Great, Great advice. Okay. Well, I learned something today. I learned you guys are doing a lot of stuff under 50,000 direct that I didn't know about. And um, I know we have a lot of existing businesses that end up at Valley Strong and are very happy, but uh, that's good to learn. So love it when I learn stuff on Webinar Wednesday. So <laughs> thank you so much, Deanna. Thank you so much, Shante. Great having both of you. And you will get an invitation once the CDFI expands and some of the programs to come back on and talk about some of the great things going on. So for Deanna and Shante, Kelly Bearden, we are out of here this week. We'll be back next week with another webinar. We'll see you then. Bye-bye, everyone.